So there's a little bit of excitement today. Um, earlier this morning, a uh, sparrow flew into my office, and um, he was hanging out there for a while, and I gently asked him to leave. So now he's in here. So if you uh, see him flying around, you can pray for him, because I'm sure this is very stressful for him. Now, almost every message in this series on relationships is meant for all of you, hopefully helpful for all of you. And you can tell we've been really trying to make you work, and we're working too. Um, if you look at all the things we've done, it's like, hey, it takes effort and work to build community. It takes effort to reconcile with people. It takes effort to go deeper. Um, However, I will say that the message today is aimed at a particular subset of all of you. Um, it's particularly for those of you who are either A, in a romantic relationship, or B, would like to be in a romantic relationship. In fact, it's even a narrower range. This sermon is really for those of you who are interested in knowing how to have a relationship built on a biblical foundation. Interested in knowing what it's like to have a marriage based on what the Bible reveals to us about a marriage between a man and a woman. Now, I'm not so tone deaf as to not know that in this moment in our culture, there are multiple interpretations of gender and sexuality and what makes a great marriage. But today I'm focusing on one of those understandings, this particular one, what the Bible reveals to us. So this is going to be for a subset of you, but also uh, in a few minutes we're going to get to some really helpful tools for how to love people well. And so I think those are going to work for all your relationships, whether it's with your family, with your friends. I think there's going to be part of this that is going to be for everyone. But first, I want to go back to this biblical understanding of marriage and, and what does this mean? The primary big ideas about it. So we're going back to Genesis chapter 1, which is literally the book of beginnings, okay? And so what you need to understand is the scriptures are claiming this is not a cultural add-on. Like when we see what is written there, it's not like, oh, some culture came up with this or this is what we're adding. It's the, the scripture is claiming this is part of the structure of of reality. And so we begin in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 to 28, and it says this In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. In other words, have babies. God made us men and women, which means our biology, like all other mammals, is male and female, and these two halves come together to propagate the species. So what God's word declares is tied directly to the way our species actually works. But what we see up here is much more than a correspondence to physical biology. It says humans are not only created male and female, they're created in the image of God. We really do have a special place of honor and a special place of responsibility in the creation. But it's not that God is male and men are created in the image of God. It is that both women and men are created in the image of God. Therefore, both have equal dignity. And just a quick side note for those of you who care deeply about justice and equality and inclusion, and I know many of you here have that same heart as I do. There is no sentence in the history of the world that has done more to free people from slavery, sexism, racism, and all kinds of injustice than that sentence up there. If you go back and look at actual human history, you will find I'm correct. There is no sentence ever written that has done more to bring beautiful equality to all. And yet that sentence, which brings exactly that, is considered offensive and problematic in this cultural moment. Maybe this cultural moment is problematic. Because think about what that verse implies. And think about the history of the world. 
why shouldn't my tribe dominate other tribes? Why shouldn't that be the case? Why shouldn't I do that? Why shouldn't men dominate women? Why shouldn't the strong dominate the weak? Because we're all created in the image of God. However you identify, we are all created in the image of God. Therefore, every person on this planet has value and worth and dignity. And that is why we have to restrain those impulses that my tribe dominate the other tribe. And what was God's purpose in this arrangement for males and females before the fall of humanity? To bless them. So our sexuality was never meant to be a curse. It was meant to be a blessing. Genesis 2 goes on. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. So rather than the medieval idea that a woman is like some piece of property to be transferred from one household to another, the scriptures say, no, it's the man who needs to leave his family. And this one flesh is the birth of a new family. And your relationship to your spouse now takes precedence to your relationship to your parents. Yes, we love our parents. Yes, we support them. But this is the birth of a new family, and now my responsibility is first to my wife and then to my parents. Marriage is less of the joining of two families, which it is, right? That part's beautiful, but it is less the joining of two families and more the birth of this new one. And what was marriage like prior to the fall of humanity? The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Now, when we hear those words, we think of the story of Adam and Eve and they're walking around with fig leaves and all this stuff, but... What would it be like to stand naked before your spouse, not only physically, but to be emotionally naked, to be spiritually naked? No secrets, no lies, utterly transparent before your spouse. Not one merged self but two selves utterly bare before each other. And they felt no shame. Imagine what it would feel like to feel no shame at all. No shame about anything. So let me ask a hard question. If you're in a relationship, do you ever make your partner feel shame? Do you ever mock them or put them down or point out their flaws? Do you have a critical spirit or do you ever disrespect them or intentionally make them feel small? Perhaps one of the major signs of a healthy marriage is the lack of shame the ability to be fully honest, the good, the bad, the ugly, fully naked before each other and yet feel no rejection, no critical spirit, no shame. But a lot of us feel shame, don't we? About a lot of things. A lot of marriages are not what they could be. And a lot of people have given them hope that they could ever be better. How often have we heard things like this, and maybe you've said them yourself? Before we got married, it was awesome. It was magic. We were so in love. But now, two years in, 30 years in, he doesn't love me anymore. She doesn't love me anymore. It's not the same. We don't talk. We're not sexually intimate. We don't do things together. He doesn't help me. I do everything 
We're more like roommates. We're, we're coexisting in the same house, but there's no passion. This is not what I signed up for. So then when you're feeling that way, it almost looks like there's only two choices. You get divorced or you just put up with this dead, empty relationship for the rest of your life. So you either resign yourself to a life of misery or you jump ship and you try it again with somebody else. But what if there was a third choice? What if there was a third way between those two? What if there was hope? And I think there is. And I think what we're talking about today, this is the beauty of it. I don't care how long you've been married. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how long you've been dating. This could start to change today for the better. We need to start, if we're going to get there, though, by defining two different types of love. The natural process of a couple coming together starts with the first stage of infatuation that we call falling in love. And I, man, it's the most awesome feeling, right? Like, I remember teenage crushes. I literally was, like, starstruck, like, oh. She's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. You know, she's perfect. You know, like you just, and what happens? You just think about this person all the time and you don't think about anybody else. And you are literally distracted. Like you're late to class. You miss your job. Like think about how many things happen when somebody is really carried away with someone. And here's the thing. Our culture tells us that that's the way it's always supposed to be. And that is a lie. And further, it's completely untenable. Like our species would not exist still if we did that. Because think about how irresponsible you come. You're so focused on that, you're not focused on anything else. And how many of you know someone whose grades dropped or they lost a job? How many people do you know who've made really bad decisions or shown really poor judgment because they were so infatuated with somebody. You know, you have this illusion that your beloved is perfect. They can do no wrong. So by definition, that's untenable. That can't last forever. So this is what researchers tell us. They tell us that the average lifespan of romantic obsession is about two years. So some people are less, some people are more, but after about two years, the honeymoon is over. And what happens then? Sometimes it's great. What happens then? Sometimes, well, your actual personality reasserts itself. And then what were once her endearing quirks are now merely just annoying. What was once his sharp wit and sense of humor is now merely wounding. And routine and resentment eat away at the love they once had. And because of this, many come to curse marriage. They feel like they've been ripped off. They've been deceived. It's not what they were promised. Five years into a marriage, you don't feel the way you felt when you were dating. And then some people say, some people think, once we were in love, but not anymore. Now it's gone. This marriage is broken. But what if the real problem is simply that your love tank has grown empty? I'm not saying it's absolutely not absolutely heartbreaking, but what if what's going on is actually different than you thought? What if each of us from childhood has deep emotional needs that need to be met, need to be filled, and we're going to try and find some way to get them filled? And so when those needs are met, we feel full, and when those needs are not met, we feel empty. So think about your car. Think about your marriage like a car. And the car is stuck. It's just, it's not going anywhere. Well, maybe it's because the engine blew up, right? Like it's just broken. But maybe it's just that it ran out of fuel. Those are two very different situations. Two very different things. One is a permanent break. Like it's broken and you can't fix it. But the other is we just need to put gas in it. If your love tank is on empty, but it could be refueled, that would mean that you could actually begin to move forward again. So in his book, The Five Love Languages, Gary Chapman asks this, could it be that deep inside hurting couples exists an invisible emotional love tank with its gauge on empty? 
Could the misbehavior, could the withdrawal, could the harsh words, could the critical spirit occur because that tank is empty? If we could find a way to fill it, could the marriage be reborn? I think that good marriages can be even better, and I think that many marriages that feel hopeless could actually be really improved, and that gives me so much hope. When both persons' emotional needs are met, that's when your marriage can take a whole new dimension. So I'm going to be drawing upon Chapman's work uh, in this sermon. Many of you have heard of this before, the five love languages. I think going back to the basics again and again is exactly what I need. And if this is new to you, I hope this will be really encouraging. I think this is really profound. So in review, there's a major difference between infatuation, being in love, and the kind of love that will last you 50 years. Real love is not just the emotional feeling, but also an act of the will. I need to be loved by someone who chooses to love me. That's a really big choice for her. (laughs) I just want to point out that the only person who who could put up with me enough to marry me was a psychologist. So I think that says (laughs) says a lot. (laughs) But think about this. Someone who says, I am married to you and therefore... I choose to look out for your interests. That's the deal. I chose to marry you, and therefore I choose to look out for your interests. Then that might not sound very romantic. That might sound pretty sterile. You might say, where are the shooting stars in all that? And yet the best way to rekindle romantic love is actually to fill the love tank. And that is hard work. It is the hard work of choosing, and here's the key for today, choosing to love someone in the way that they want to be loved. When both parties feel truly loved, the return of romance really becomes a possibility. But unless both parties feel truly loved, it will never happen. You will stay in the exact same dance that you're doing now. And you might say, but I did, I did, I loved my spouse. I tried to love them and I gave to them and they didn't respond or they took it for granted or they didn't appreciate it. But notice, I didn't say what is needed is that you love your spouse. I said that they need to feel loved and those are two different things. And many of you have heard the example I always use, but it's right in my head. The guy is driving home, thinks how much he loves his wife, sees the 7-Eleven, stops by, if he's cheap like me, he goes to the 7-Eleven. He buys flowers and candy and chocolate and he brings it home to his wife and goes, babe, I love you. Look what I brought for you. And she's like, that's great, but why didn't you fix the toilet for the last two years that I've been asking you every day? And so then what happens? They're both ticked off. They're both hurt because they were speaking two different love languages. He was speaking one love language and she was needing another and they completely misinterpreted. It's so tragic because he was really trying to do a good thing, but it wasn't effective. And I'm not saying that love solves everything. I get the practical real world concerns. There are bills to pay and there are mouths to feed. But when both parties feel truly loved, what happens? What is produced? Security? Self-worth, a feeling of significance. See, all those crucial things that we all need to flourish. When we feel deeply loved, it it boisters those. It creates an environment where we, we can begin to move together again. So the next question for those of you who are in a relationship right now, whether you're married or dating or whatever it is, on a scale of zero to 10, how full is your love tank? How loved How emotionally satisfied do you feel with your relationship? So let's say you know that your own tank isn't getting filled by your relationship. And by the way that they are behaving and the way they are treating you, it seems pretty clear that your partner does not feel that their love tank is filled. If you're both feeling miserable, it's pretty safe to assume you're both running on an empty tank. So how can you go about filling that love tank? Well, here's the first thing. You can't. You can't fill your own, you can only fill theirs. And they can't fill their own, they can only fill yours. Okay, well let's say you're actually at the point where you want to do that. Like, even though it, you're beaten down, you're frustrated, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm willing to do that. How can you actually do that? I think I can tell you. 
I really do. It's pretty straightforward. It's just not easy. And here it is. You figure out what their love language is, and you choose to love them that way. I'm just going to say it again. This is the whole thing. You figure out what their love language actually is, and you choose to love them not the way you think they should be loved, not the way you want to be loved. You love them the way they need to be loved. That's it. So Gary Chapman claims there are five basic love languages. There are words of affirmation that what I need most from you is words of affirmation. There are acts of service. What I need most from you is for you to, to just do practical things for me around the house. So there's the receiving of gifts. When you, when you actually go out and buy me gifts, it's so symbolic of the thought behind the gift. It's quality time. It's like, I don't need words. I don't need deeds. I, just, I don't need gifts. I just want to be with you. It's physical touch. I just want your embrace. Every person has a primary way they want to be loved. This is what Chapman claims, and I think he's right. They have a primary love language. It may have come from how they saw love in their own family. It may be a reaction to what they saw in their own family. It, it could be from later in life. We don't know exactly where it comes from, but each one of us, there's a way of being loved that is so much more meaningful to us than all the other ways of being loved. So my goal for today is that you figure out what your love language is and what your partner's love language is. Because it's very rare for two people to marry or date who have the same love language. So if one of us is speaking Spanish and the other is speaking Portuguese, wouldn't it make sense we misunderstand and frustrate each other? Each of us has a native tongue. And so the first thing we need to figure out is, what is my own native tongue? What is my own love language? But then the second thing I have to figure out is, what is their love language? What is their native tongue? And here's the hard part. Would I be willing to learn it and speak it? Which brings us to these two questions. First, are you willing to learn a second language for the sake of your relationship? So think about like actually learning like Spanish or French or whatever you don't know. We feel so comfortable in our own native language. We were talking about this at the uh, project yesterday. Like, people who are learning Spanish, and like, it's not their native tongue. And it's so easy just to speak the English they're used to. And it, it's so hard to speak a, a second language. And, and we feel awkward, and we feel uncomfortable, and we feel like an amateur trying to use a foreign language. But the more you practice, the better you get. But it's also true, when you stop using it, you get rusty. And so the second question is, what language do you need to learn to love your partner effectively? So I'm going to give you two clues that help you figure it out. How does your spouse res respond when you try to show affection? If they're like, that ain't doing it for me. That's a pretty good sign that you're not speaking their love language. Like if you try to love somebody and, and it feels like they're, they're being unresponsive or they don't even appreciate you, maybe it's not that. It's that you're not speaking the right love language. Second, what your spouse asks for most often or complains about the most is a clue. That's a really good clue. So rather than getting angry that they're complaining, say, hey, I'm getting data here. This, this is telling me what their love language is. So I'm going to go just once again through those five really quickly. And as I do, I want you to ask yourself, which one of these is my native tongue and which one is my partner's native tongue? So like I said, the first language is words of affirmation, compliments, encouraging words, words that build up. You look great. I'm so proud of you. You did a great job on that. I like how you always are on time to pick me up. I really appreciate how you take care of our family. I'm really thankful for what you did over there. So newsflash, verbal compliments are far greater motivators than nagging words. The second love language is acts of service, right? I just, when you do practical things, when you take out the garbage, when you wash the dishes, like whatever it is, when you do those things, that is what makes me feel loved, those practical things. I don't need words. Actions speak louder than words to me. And then that third love language of receiving gifts. You know, um, this is not my love language, um, actually, it's not yours either, neither of us, which is a good thing, because that's, you know. But here's the thing, with people who this is their gift, it, it is so symbolic to them. It's like when you buy me a gift, 
It's symbolic of, of how you actually feel. And what happens to people who don't have this as their love language is they're like, man, all you want me to do is like buy gifts and spend money? Like, like this isn't a good use of resources and, and, and we're tight on money and we need to plan. Well, if you're one of those people, let's get honest for a moment. You are caring for your own emotional needs by the way you handle your money. It's giving you emotional satisfaction to handle your money a certain way. What you're not doing is meeting the emotional needs of your spouse. And if you're Mr. Hardcore or Mrs. Hardcore Finance, what if to invest in loving your spouse is to invest in blue chip stocks? What if the actual best thing you could do with your money for the long-term happiness is to Invest in gifts for your spouse, the kind that they most desire. Not, not what you think they should have, not what you think they like, but what they would like. Wouldn't that actually be a really good use of your money? The fourth love language is quality time. Again, this is a person who says, it's not what you need to say to me. It's not words. It's not what you do for me. It's not giving me gifts. I just want to do life with you. I want to be alongside you. I want to know what you're thinking and feeling. I want to share those ideas. And again, obviously, quality time doesn't mean sitting on the couch watching television together. It means undivided attention. This, I read this next sentence uh, from someone, and it really convicted me. When you spend more time watching news or watching the sports game then you spend listening to your spouse, you end up more concerned about the Middle East than about your spouse or more concerned about the team than your spouse. Consider the difference you've seen. You go out to a restaurant and you can tell like there's this young couple and they're dating and then there's like this old couple. <laughs> like you and me. Right? And you look at the young couple and they're dating. And what are they doing? I'm seeing all these young couples here. It's so cool. Um, they're looking deep into each other's eyes. And they're talking. And they're listening. And they're really interested. And maybe even sharing their actual feelings and their hopes and their dreams for the future. You know, and then sometimes you look at a married couple and they're just not even looking at each other. You know, like they're watching the sports thing. or You know, like that's not good. So quality time is I'm, I'm focused on you. I'm intentionally Spending time with you. And so the last love language is physical touch. These people feel most loved, not by words, not by service, not by listening, not by physical, but by physical embrace. So holding hands, kissing, embracing, sexual intercourse, all these things communicate to them, my spouse really loves me. Now I need to make a stereotypical comment here. This is not prescriptive, this is descriptive. Many men make the mistake of assuming that physical touch is their primary love language because they desire sexual intercourse so intensely. Because the male physiology pushes them to have sexual release on a somewhat regular basis, men often automatically assume, well, this must be my primary love language. Now, it may be, but often it's secondary. And actually, it's one of the other four that really is their primary love language. And I will say this. Whatever love languages you two have, if each is genuinely trying to love the other in their own love language, sexual intimacy is much more likely to follow. So we put this all together, and what do we get? Five different ways of wanting to be loved. Which one are you? Which one is your spouse or your significant other? Five different ways that people want to be loved. Learning the right love language is the key to helping another person feel loved. Wouldn't you want to do that? And practically speaking, you're not going to truly enjoy your marriage until you love your spouse in the love language they most desire. And so here's the deal. Maybe you're still like, I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, I've given you a link in the email and on the website. You can go to this link and you can take a test. And your partner can take it. And it'll give you a pretty good idea of your love languages. Wouldn't this be a great conversation starter this afternoon? Go home and do it and see what you learn. It might be really, really interesting. I've also put a link to the book so that you could go deeper with this. I'm just giving you an oversight, but this book, millions of people, that's an accurate word, millions of people 
have found this really helpful. And it's not just a realistic way to invest in your own future happiness. Like, if you want to be totally pragmatic, you're, you're not only loving your, your significant other, you're actually increasing your own odds of actually having future happiness. That's great, but there's much more to that if you call yourself a Christian. If I love God, I have a responsibility and a calling to love my spouse well. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 13 says this. See to it that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And then 1 Corinthians 13, that many of you know so well that we hear at weddings, says, love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, it always perseveres. So here's the deal. If you're a Christian, if you're trying to follow after Jesus, you are commanded to love God and love your neighbor. And your spouse might be a lot more than your neighbor, but they're not less. They're not less. One of the most important ways I can encourage my spouse, and it says I'm to encourage my spouse daily, is to speak their love language. And look at that definition of love again in 1 Corinthians. I'm just going to ask you a hard question. With your spouse, with the person you're dating, are you patient? Are you kind? Or are you proud? Rude? Self-seeking? easily angered. Do you keep a record of wrongs? Are you striving to persevere? Or have you given up? You might say, okay, okay, love language is great, great, great. But how do we speak each other's love language when we're so full of hurt, so full of anger, so full of resentment, when it feels so dead, when there's been so many past failures? Well, if we have the capacity to make poor choices, don't we have the capacity to make good choices? All of us have made poor choices in the past. But poor choices in the past don't we mean we must make them in the future. It is possible to say, I am sorry. I know I have hurt you. But I want the future to be different. So here's the deal. Love in the present does not erase the past, but it makes a different future possible. When we discover the primary love language of our spouse and we choose to speak that, whether or not it's natural for us, things begin to change. And when we do that, we're not claiming we feel all lovey-dovey. We're simply choosing to do it for their benefit out of obedience to Christ. You know, when an action doesn't come naturally to us, we're like, oh, well, that's not real love. No, that's exactly love. When an action doesn't come naturally to you, it's actually a greater expression of love when you do it. So I want to end today with two questions. First, for those of you who your relationship is going pretty well, if love is a commitment and love is a choice, what if you both agreed to try to do a short list of the way the other wants to be loved? You know, not the unending list of eight million things, but like, I know these are two or three things that are really important to her. I know these are two or three things he's told me are really important to him. I'm going to do this out of love for them. Or let's say you're in a more serious situation where, you know, your relationship is just blown up. If your partner is intransient, would you be willing to try a six-month experiment of intentionally loving them in their own love language to see what happens? Like, maybe it won't work. Maybe the relationship is dead. But wouldn't it be worth it to try? This is a challenge that Chapman actually has given multiple couples, and it has turned relationships around. Would I be willing to do that? Would you be willing to do that? So again, if you want to go deeper with this and take it to the next level, I encourage you to go to our website. You can get that book. You can take the survey. You can figure this out. 
If you're in a relationship with someone, I strongly encourage you, have this conversation. Ruth and I had it at Cinco de Mayo the other day. It was really fun. And we did have some margaritas with it, but it was really, it was really fun. Um, So what I want to do is leave you with this thought. Even now, your relationship can get even better. I don't care if you've been married 30 years. It could get better than it is now. I don't care if you've been only dating for a month. It could get better. How cool is that? I often say to, to people in premarital counseling something I believe with all my heart. You can be more in love 20 years from now than you are now. Let's pray. Father God, I pray for every person in this room. These five love languages can be used with all our relationships, with people in our family, with our friends, with our coworkers. Maybe somebody comes to mind right now. I also pray for those especially who are in difficult marriages, that they would not give up hope, that they would go the extra mile and and see what happens when they try to live this way. I pray for those here who are not in a relationship and their heart aches to be in one. Lord, I pray you would be with them and that you would walk through this season with them. Lord, hear their prayer. Hear all our prayers, Lord, and help us to love each other well. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us today as we strive to think carefully about our faith. You can help keep this ministry on the air by making a donation at leverington.org. For now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. We'll see you next time.